Hello, everyone. This is Tony Miracker, and I'm the uh, section chair for the Toronto section. For some reason, I can't get my camera to go, so I will uh, I'll be in, in video silence, but I will have my audio. Um, yes, this is our, our November meeting of uh, the Toronto section, and we welcome everybody. So, Roy, if I can get you to move to the next slide. Uh, sponsors tonight are the Toronto uh, section. Um, we we have yet to get back to the face-to-face -face side of things, so we will uh, hopefully be doing that soon. Um, next slide. So tonight's meeting is edge computing for the media industry. Uh, this is a great topic. Uh, some interesting um topics that we have or presenters that we have. Uh, arranging tonight's meeting is uh, Jamie Sorrell, um, Ilya Dorian, and Roy Falkman. Uh, presenters include Chris Lapp from Cisco and Michael Lally from also from Cisco, uh, Grant McGivery from NBC Distribution, MDBC Universal Distribution Engineering Group, and we got Paul Brown from Vineon Labs. Um, next slide. The, the, the way the most meetings we've had, um, Roy is going to be uh, doing the same sort, uh, following the same routine. Roy is going to introduce and read presenter bios, and he will manage the question uh, box as well. Uh, we're going to do something different tonight, and we're going to take some um, questions after each pre presentation. Uh, some of our presenters have a tight time table so we will be opening up questions after each presenters and and again um, there is a opportunity to add questions to the uh, zoom question box so if you can do that there then uh, Roy will be able to pick it up and and ask the presenters their question um, next slide And I think this is where I'm going to hand it off to uh, Roy, who will uh, take over the uh, the meeting. And I'll see you back at the uh, back end for some closing comments. Sounds take great. Away, thank, Roy. Uh, thank you, Tony. Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Bienvenue. Uh, I thought at the start I would share just a couple of quick slides, but get to our presenters quickly. We're very grateful. Some excellent presenters tonight. A quick definition from our, our trusted source, Wikipedia for edge computing, a distributed computing paradigm that brings computation and data storage closer to the sources of data. And for media applications, we should also say uh, consumption or consumers of data at the edge. This is expected to improve response times and save bandwidth. Edge computing, IoT is a use case of edge computing. Smartphones, of course, are the ubiquitous edge computing device that we all have. There's a branch of edge computing called mobile edge computing, and the acronym is MEC, which in Canada confuses us because when we hear MEC, we think of Mountain Equipment Co-op, uh, which is our outdoor supply store in Canada. Uh, edge computing use cases for our industry encoding, decoding, graphics rendering, signal processing, comm, switching, and more. I'm going to give a quick industry for context. To those of you for whom edge computing may not be top of mind, I hope this is helpful. And I don't want to, I didn't want to steal any thunder from our presenters. So I give, I'm going to give an example from outside the media industry. But as I describe this, I think you will see parallels to criteria and requirements and considerations in media. So a self-driving car is an edge computing device. And in this simple drawing, an edge, it shows an edge, uh, a, a self-driving car, an edge device as it's driving around, communicating with cell towers and back to a data center, which represents the core of the network. So the data center being the core, the, the, the self-driving car being the edge computing device. And in this application, if there is a critical safety situation, say a car, this car is driving 100 kilometers per hour down a highway and a tree falls in the road. For that application, 
to answer the question, how fast do you want to react? The obvious and clear answer is you want to react as fast as possible. So for that application, you want to keep compute at the edge. You don't want to communicate back to the data center because that could add latency and prevent uh, a proper and appropriate and necessary response to that tree in the road. So latency is crucial. You keep the compute at the edge device, which is the car, to, to analyze and react very quickly. For image analysis that the self-driving car performs, you want high resolution image capture. You want to read small signs. You want to detect motion, uh, small images uh, or objects that may come out into the road. You want to analyze those, see everything. So likely a 4K camera on board, analyzing uncompressed video. And again, reacting to it very quickly. So you keep that at the edge in the, in the self-driving car. And cost would be prohibitive, certainly to send uncompressed UHD content back to the data center. Along with analyzing content, you, you would of course also want to feed video back to the data, data center, but latency less critical on those feeds. So of course, you, you encode that feed, those feeds to do a bit rate reduction, save costs, and feed those back to, to the data center. So as I describe this, you're, I, I sense, or I, I, I hope you're getting, sensing some parallels between media systems and this self-driving car application. In the data center, there's compute that's happening, of course, location data analysis, traffic analysis, navigation monitoring, map updates, vehicle performance data. Uh, and, and from the data center, it is pushing information out to the car, but not reacting to time sensitive um, situations. So it could push out traffic information, map updates, but those can be done seconds, minutes, or hours, uh, depending on where, in advance, depending on where the car is. So uh, I hope that's, hope that's helpful. Uh, and as you, can, as you know, in media, we're certainly designing systems where certain applications have um, latency requirements that are critical and certain uh, and image requirements, image quality requirements that are critical uh, and others for encoding and decoding where there's all sorts of other criteria. So moving on to our presenters, again, we're really grateful to the presenters. Uh, Cisco is going to present first uh, to two gentlemen from Cisco, Chris Lapp. Chris Lapp is uh, the technical solutions architect for the media and entertainment vertical in North America. As a technical solutions architect, Chris provides thought leadership to sales teams, helping media customers realize their business outcomes through Cisco technology. He brings a wealth of knowledge and experience to Cisco from past experience in the broadcast industry with operations, manufacturing, and systems system integration. In his spare time, Chris trains for obstacle course races, rock climbs, uh, and enjoys spending time with his daughters. Uh, I'll also share, Chris, hope you don't mind me saying this. Of course, it's a Canadian meeting, but Chris is Canadian. Many of you uh, uh, know Chris. And Michael Lally from Cisco. Michael Lally is a technical solutions architect at Cisco, supporting large service providers and media companies. Throughout his career, Mike has had the privilege of working in numerous hardware and software technologies, ranging from SATCOM and telephone networks to IP-based video analysis. Mike currently focuses on data center technologies, including cloud, compute, networking, storage, and automation. Outside of work, Mike enjoys running and being a nerd dad to his five kids. So Chris and Michael, take it away. Thank you again. Thanks, Roy. Um, it is telling me that you need to stop sharing. Uh, I seem to have lost the ability to kick you off. Okay, I have stopped. Thank you. Perfect, just do a quick screen check. Yeah, I think we're good. Gotcha. Take her away, Mike. Great, thanks, Chris, thanks, Roy. Um, great tea up there, by the way, Roy. I, I think you really framed the conversation nicely. Um, so our thesis for tonight is something I've entitled conundrums of the distributed edge. Um, and I generally like to use big words like conundrum just to make myself sound smarter than I actually am. Um, it's a little bit of a word salad here, but um, I'll, I'll read the thesis to you. So my idea is that service providers, including media companies, 
need simple, integrated, high efficacy, end-to-end -end operational solutions for deploying and managing assets at the edge, as well as the networks that connect them. Um, and I think oftentimes, you know, the edge compute discussion loses the need for specialized networks and network technologies that connect these edge compute um, platforms and applications to the, the broader um, networks and, and other uh, applications that they're, they're working with. Um, and what's driving this, right? So there's, there's kind of three areas that I think uh, are, are one driving what happens at the edge, but are also very key considerations of, of how we look at what the edge is going to become. Um, you know, often when we think of edge, it, it comes from what happened in the telecom world with, with 5G coming on board. So, you know, as the edge is, is transforming, we've got to consider what the users are doing, what the devices are doing, what the networks are doing, and what the application and data security models are going to be, right? 5G really touches on, I, I'd say, all of those things. Um, automation and programmability are going to be key. You know, as, as, as you look at this, and I, I probably should have underlined the word distributed there a number of times, um, I don't, don't think that you can have edge deployments without having a widely distributed uh, ecosystem of technologies out there. Um, so in order to, to manage those technologies, automation and programmability are gonna be key. So you need to allow, um, I'll say the transport for those edge services, but as well as the compute and the applications to really differentiate what those services are. And then I think this all comes full circle with full stack observability. Um, so as you have these massively distributed applications, um, you need to be able to monitor and maintain certain levels of application performance and network performance. Uh, these two things are inextricably linked. Uh, and without full stack obser observability, you're not going to be able to discern if the network, uh, if the compute platform or the application um, is the culprit when you run into some type of performance issue. Next slide, please, Chris. So this is kind of the, the model or the paradigm um, I like to view edge compute as. And, and the idea being that um, we're not going to be using edge computer or any edge resource just for the sake of having something at the edge, right? There are going to be very key considerations that really decide where uh, a certain workload is going to go within the larger range of, of um, data centers or, or uh, points of presence that we have. Um, so you can see at the bottom, I've got um, you know, some, some major um, ideas or, or major uh, properties associated with each of these layers. And at the top, we kind of have a continuum of how uh, workloads and, and how the workloads are transformed throughout these different layers. Uh, so I'll start on the left and kind of work my way over to the right. So at the edge, um, obviously, and, and Roy pointed this out, we're really gonna be focused on real-time processing, right? I'm not gonna be putting something in any type of edge location if I don't need that very low latency, um, real-time processing. Uh, any storage I have is gonna be transient, right? Typically these edge locations, uh, whether it's a car or whether it's um, the base station at the bottom of a cell tower, I'm generally limited on the resources I have there. So I can't support large amounts of, of spinning disk or even SSD. Um, I have many considerations associated around that. Um, and then, you know, with the response time, I'm gonna be putting things there because I need that microsecond or millisecond uh, response. Um, anything more than that is going to destroy the outcome uh, or the experience of the application that I'm utilizing. Uh, and at the top, you know, when we think of, of edge devices, Really, there's typically a, a circle, uh, a, a circular flow that happens where the edge device is going to be transmitting uh, real time data, possibly doing some type of processing. Uh, and then within that edge location, whether it's, you know, physically within a car or, you know, that that cell station in, in the um, smart car, self driving car uh, analogy. Um, that processing is going to be real time and what is going to be spitting back to the edge device is some type of typically control or actuation property, right? I'm not gonna be doing deep data processing uh, at the edge. I'm gonna be doing things that are, are very quick um, and typically you know, part of my control plane interface. As we move further into the network towards uh, what I will call an aggregation point, um, and you know, this is coming from my SP 
kind of telecom um, background, uh, you know, what we're going to be doing there, the functions that are going to be happening there are going to be things like uh, basic analysis. We'll be doing some filtering, some data normalization, and then aggregation of possibly many data streams. Um, any storage there is going to be semi-permanent, uh, meaning that I'll, I'll have it, you know, for some period of time, but it's, it's certainly not months, years, or any type of, of what we refer to as cold storage. And typically the response times that um, I'll have at an egg uh, site, they, they can be in the milliseconds for sure, but I, I can uh, handle response times up to the seconds, you know, the low seconds. As we move again further down um, the line into a cloud, and, and I should make the point that I'm not distinguishing between on-prem private cloud or public cloud. I'm just thinking of cloud as, as really a centralized data center. Uh, the functions that we're going to be doing there are going to be deeper analysis, trending, and history. So these are, are where, you know, I, I like to think of big data type functions are going to be best suited for these cloud site type um, locations. My storage is going to be very long, months to years. So this is where I would possibly have to have some very deep historical data to be able to understand the trending and the history uh, analysis that has to be done. Um, and then my response could be up to hours, possibly, depending on the type of workload that's running. You know, if I'm doing a, a very large uh, job on a Hadoop cluster, that is going to take some significant time. Um, and I'm going to need significant resources to be able to do that, which is why that workload uh, is going to be sitting in a cloud. And then when we get to the client app piece of it, you know, that, that's where we're really looking at, at the true valuable uh, insights that we're going to be getting out of whatever this continuum is. So whether it's true business intelligence, whether it's visualizing dashboards, however that works, the client app is where we get to the, the wisdom aspect of this. Next slide, please. So one thing to be cognizant of, you know, as we're thinking of edge compute is that not all cores are created equal. Um, you see a number of logos on the slide, a number of leading questions. And it's important to understand that in an edge situation, um, and I think that the smart car again is, is a great analogy, right? I'm probably gonna have a number of, you know, TI type or ARM type or Qualcomm type processors doing that edge compute. Um, if I'm doing something, you know, more in a media type workload, I'm probably gonna need Intel, AMD, and very likely some NVIDIA CUDA cores uh, handling those workloads. Um, if it's something you know, more analytics-based, there could be some Spark or some IBM processors. Um, and I think the big takeaway from this is that there is no one size fits all for an edge compute or really edge solution. You know, Some of these things could even be, uh, I mentioned the network in the, the beginning of this, um, I might have an embedded compute platform that sits within my edge network device. So that way I, I've got extremely low latency and extremely quick response between what's happening on the network and keeping you know, that network slice or that net network function relevant to what's actually happening on the compute platform. Um, so as we you know, look to the future of edge and what edge is gonna be, uh, there are gonna be some very, very key considerations um, specifically around, I think CPU selection and the types of cores that are gonna be going into the specific platforms. Um, strictly because, uh, as I said, there really is no one size fits all solution for any of this. Go ahead, Chris. Thanks, Mike. So to take everything that Mike just said and kind of equate it back to the media industry, and we really have to look at what is important for media that's happened over the last few years that edge compute can really help us start to kind of build a picture to solve. So the first thing is in the broadcast industry and the media industry, we're always concerned about latency. And as Roy said, you know, we can solve that. So that since the last mile has always been a bottleneck in our broadcast and media workloads, bringing those large workloads like that require, you know, lots of compute, we can bring them to the edge and overcome this latency. But the difference between other edge use cases in media is now, again, we're focusing on that consumer of the content. The consumer is the one who wants to have less latency so we can reduce that. Security is another one. So. I'm sure you've all seen it in the last few years, broadcasters have been this huge target for cyber attacks. We recently saw one in Australia where nine was brought down for a number of days because of a cyber attack. So decentralizing your you know, compute platform and your data center can actually reduce the impact of such attacks. The other one is insights. So if you crunch data closer to the end user, you can actually increase the availability of that data 
and avoid periodic sur surges in traffic. And you can actually you know, start to gather more data with more sampling and get better insights from that data. And then the last thing I wanna talk about is the enhancement of you know, our technology. So you can incorporate edge technologies without a need to completely overhaul your network. So you can get these new experiences that edge can bring without completely redesigning your data center. So I thought about this presentation and tried to build out, you know, what did I think was driving edge technologies for broadcast and media? And I wanted to focus just a little bit more on broadcast because they're the ones who are feeling the heat a little bit more. So ATSC 3.0 is truly going to be one of the biggest drivers for edge technologies that's coming out. Um, so with ATSC 3.0, it allows us to combine our traditional over the air transport mechanisms with internet that will give us tools that will hopefully allow broadcasters to exceed the value of what traditional BDUs or MVPDs, whatever you wanna call them, can deliver. We can use a single slice of spectrum to deliver much more content at fractional costs. It also gives us a larger market to target. And so now we don't just have televisions, but we have mobile devices as well as computers and tablets that can receive ATSC 3.0. So edge computing can help maximize the benefit of this technology with the need for internet as well. We also know that the other driving factors, you know, cord cutting. So more and more consumers are getting rid of their subscriptions and cable and satellite providers in favor of online streaming platforms, Netflix, Disney Plus, Amazon Prime, Peacock in the US. These streaming platforms require the use of a CDN network or a content delivery network, which is another edge technology application. So edge computing is a natural complement to those CDN networks. Technical. So just a bit about edge compute use cases for media, because we wanna think about all the things that we can start to do with this technology, keeping in mind that it's relatively new. So the first side of things is on the content creation uh, side of things. So remote production, more agile content gathering, being able to create hyper-local news, being able to specify a geography of news and target it specifically with different content. Now on the specific content that you're creating, we can have targeted content and not just targeted content to a geographic location, but targeted content to a user being able to store targeted ads in that edge platform and distribute them out based on that user's interest. Then we can have interest-based content itself, better shows, better programming for that user, more local advertising, and on top of the EAS system that already exists, we can start to build in community alerts for geographic locations. On the distribution side of things, we have content caching. There's also less need for encode and decode because we can do it at the edge and reuse the same compute. And we can also do more remote monitoring. So one of the things that in broadcast that I was used to doing when I worked at a station was at the far end, we would have a couple cable boxes and you know, we would feed those signals into a VIP or a multi-viewer and we'd feed that back to the station. Well, now you can actually do that at the edge with edge compute. One of my favorite categories is quality of experience. So obviously the biggest one, less latency. You know, being able to store fast response applications at the edge and having a more personalized experience. But on top of all that, now we have the ability to actually provide AR and VR experiences. Wouldn't it be cool if we could do a sporting event with volumetric video where the user can actually you know, rewind and look at the play volumetrically and look at all the statistics of that experience? That's just not possible today with you know, regular technology. There needs to be some kind of edge platform involved in that. And then on the analytics side of things, content tracking, being able to you know, actually look at what advertisements people are watching more ad attribution, and then real-time measurement of video view viewership. And with that, we have our key considerations. You know, what should you be thinking about as you go down your journey towards edge compute? So, Mike, you wanna start yeah. off on this? Or? Sure, sure, thanks, Chris. So I, I think obviously the application is gonna be driving this or, or use case, you know, I, I use application generally speaking, but, um, as I started out saying, you're not going to be deploying an edge solution just for the sake of doing something at the edge. There's got to be a true business case behind it because anything at the edge is not going to be cheap. It's not going to be easy to manage, not going to be easy to maintain. Um, and so the application and the specific use case with key business drivers behind it 
uh, are going to be really forcing you to what that edge solution is. And then I think, you know, I, I mentioned this earlier, what type of compute do you need and where do you need it? Um, edge is no, there, there's no single definition for what edge is. It could be, you know, within the smart car. It could be within a camera even. Um, it could be in a stadium. It could be um, uh, in, in a uh, broadcast truck. Um, so there's no one size fits all. There's no single definition for, for where the edge is. So you have to be cognizant of the specific needs, again, being driven by the application use case to define where that edge is and then the type of compute that has to go there. Chris? Yeah, and yeah I think the uh, after all that, now you got to look at the total cost, right? It, it's not just about buying the compute, but now you need the network infrastructure to support it. Does it actually make sp sense to spend that money on that workload to gain a couple of microseconds latency less? I mean, at the end of the day, does it make sense for your business to be doing this? Then you need to look at environmentals. You know, this is another thing that cost could apply for. Power, space, cooling. Do you have a location to put this edge computed? Are you gonna be renting a data center? And then what does the operational framework of the application actually look like? Yeah, and I think that one's really key because you know, as you're looking at the application itself, um, how am I gonna maintain that application through its life cycle? How do I manage break fix? How do I do remote monitoring of it? Because I'm obviously not going to have people manning these specific edge locations, right? So all of these things, I think, really need to be considered um, specifically for each of the applications and use cases that we're going to be talking about. That, uh, Roy, would like to ask if there's any questions. There have not yet been any questions posted, so I encourage everyone that's uh, that's listening, please go ahead and post any questions. But I thought a couple of quick comments from me. A fantastic presentation. Uh, I really like the uh, the continuum on one of the slides from data at the edge to wisdom. Uh, I thought that that's really really good. And you both mentioned insights and how, how key that is. Uh, uh, dashboards, volumetrics, uh, the, the visibility of everything that's going on from the edge to the, to the center, to the core. Yeah, and I like, I like as well, uh, Michael, you mentioned how the edge can be different, different things in different networks, right? In, in some media applications, the, the affiliate stations, I think Grant will speak to this, but the affiliate stations can be the edge of a distribution network, obviously, uh, or the end user, a mobile user with a, with a cell phone can be the, the edge of the network, just depends on, on the application. Yeah, way too many versions for us to cover in one presentation. <laughs> yeah, for sure. yeah, for sure. yeah, yeah, exactly. I and mean, I think one, one good example, Ray, is you know, what's happening in the UK with Sky and their Sky Glass product. Um, right, they're they're coming out with a smart TV that is smarter than the other smart TVs um, to essentially get rid of their set top box and handle everything from their distribution. So it's, you know, again, edge, edge is going to be different depending on the use case. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So true. So true. And I love I love I love the fact that you ended with this slide the considerations and and guidance for uh, for building media systems um, and with edge edge computing. Yeah. And it's so true what you say. Oh, pardon me. We do we do have a question. And it's a question about cost. So maybe 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 a sensitive, but maybe speak around it or to it, but uh, or generally, but uh, how the cost is modeled for edge compute. In case an app provider rents edge infrastructure, what kind of cost do we expect to have? So I would, I see the question. Uh, I, I think probably that type of ed, edge infrastructure we're thinking of, you know, maybe a, a public cloud provider's edge most likely. Um, and in that use case, I think your application is going to define how you're gonna get charged for that. So, um, you know, I, 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 I would say the application itself could be a container, it could be a function, it could be something that has to, to reside in uh, a long lived VM. Um, typically, though, if, if it's a cloud providers edge, you're, you're utilizing 
um, it's just going to be a usage-based billing model. So you, you pay for what you use and typically that's it. Um, obviously, you've got to be cognizant of, of network. Uh, typically, when we're talking about the public cloud, um, network IO is going to be a, a significant cost driver. Yeah, and there's obviously other, you know, adoption models that can kind of fit in there, but it depends on the use case. So Cisco, for example, has a, a consumption model where you pay for a certain amount of commit on a compute platform, and then you pay for spikes above that commit, things like that. You know, there's various other providers that have um, models like that. But at the end of the day, it comes down to how much are you computing? What are you doing on the network? And what is the application? And that will drive the cost. Sure, sure. Makes sense. And in, 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 in case my, my UI was misleading me, I think Grant might have indicated on there you might like to answer that question. And Grant, feel free to unmute and even, even speak uh, before your presentation. That's okay too, if you wanna, if you wanna join in at this point. Oh no, thank you though. I, <laughs> I think I, I erroneously hit the button. Erroneously, okay, gotcha, <laughs> all right, good. And I see, uh, I see another question here. Do you have any insights on the application of edge computing in the context of network slicing in 5G for media applications? So I can certainly speak to the 5G piece of that. I think, Chris, I'll need your help on the media applications. Um, but absolutely, there is significant impact on network slicing. Um, and what we're seeing is that, uh, uh, I kind of alluded to it earlier, um, a common model that, that a lot of um, network equipment companies such as Cisco are moving towards is you know, something that, that might be referred to as like a hybrid edge router where I've got a routing device that's sitting at the edge, but it also has some compute component mm -hmm. to it. So I'm able to, to handle that slicing. I, I don't require um, you know, just the NPU or just the ASIC to do that. I've actually got some intelligent compute to, to help with what those slices are gonna look like and to manage the slices as they go. Specific to a media application, Chris, can you um, maybe allude to that? Yeah, I'm not, can we define what, what kind of media application we're looking for here? Um, just because the, the use of media specific applications in 5G is kind of broad. And Diala, if you if you if you can quickly type that in, maybe while you're doing it, I'll call it Mike Michael, you mentioned boy. That's a that's an interesting and big subject, sure. isn't it? The, the combination of of routing and compute and and the capabilities of that. The live streaming you mentioned here. Oh, live streaming. So that that's a little bit different, right? Because at the end of the day, that's that's content delivery. I mean, whether it's over Netflix, Disney Plus, you're watching it on YouTube, um, delivering that content over the 5G network at the end of the day is just traffic. I don't think that, you know, from a network slicing perspective, it's really going to have much effect. But from the 5G perspective, what Mike said still, still holds true. Um, but it, we're more relying on the CDNs themselves to handle the offload of that streaming application. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, it, it, there's also like, when you talk about live streaming, there's, there's certainly regulatory things that get involved there. So am I, am I allowed to give one um, live stream provider precedence over another? If so, that could impact how I'm slicing it. Or is it, is it my own content that I'm streaming? And I want to make sure that that has the best performance, um, you know, I, I think that would certainly have the ability to drive it. At the end of the day, though, you know, when you're talking about 5G network slicing, a slice is really just, you can almost think of it as, as a queue, right? Like I've, I've got a, a queue of a certain priority and I'm giving that, that um, priority certain behavioral characteristics on how it's going to traverse the network. Um, so whether it's live streaming or, or anything else, whatever slice I put it in, is really going to drive how it traverses the network and and the um, the way that it impacts its the, how it's delivered to the end user. Yeah, it's like the age old QoS, but just yeah, a little bit right. different. Right, <laughs> right. QoS right. for the entire network. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. Just just monitoring here, see if there's any more questions. But excellent questions. That gr and great. Fantastic presentation, guys! Really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. No problem, Roy. Thanks for having yeah. us. Uh, Thanks for having us, Roy. You bet. Have a great evening. Okay. Thanks a lot.
uh, event. And next up, Paul Brown, Chief Technology Officer from Videon Labs. Paul Brown is one of the original co-founders and technology innovators of Videon. Brown has been involved with digital video for over 25 years from Intel Action Media 2, all the way to current technologies, including 4K, 8K, HEVC, streaming, Along the way, he has been involved in the design of video compute solutions for companies including Logitech, Bowers and Wilkins, Rockwell Collins, and Lufthansa Technique. Paul lives in State College, PA area, and enjoys traveling with his family. Welcome, Paul. Good evening. And I am going to share, uh, you have to stop sharing, there we go. Yeah. On the right one. Wonderful. Okay, I think we we're it. sharing a screen now. Yes, we are. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> hello, my name is uh, Paul Brown, and I'm the co founder and chief Techn uh, technology officer of Videon Labs. It's my pleasure to be talking to you uh, today about edge compute. The whole idea of edge compute is coming at us fast and furious, as the other presenters have shown. Uh, as well, it's very important to baseline a couple of key technologies that are enablers of edge compute. So let's uh, drive right in to uh, what's going on. Let's start with the whole thing about live video. Uh, live video is coming at you over and over. On this slide, there are a lot of data points that start to talk about what's happening in live video from age de demographics, be it the amount of interaction people are getting out of live video, the engagement people are getting with live video, the amount of people who say if uh, live video and uh, is in sync with other events, they would be interested in doing more and more interesting things, and how people would be interested in purchasing more video. The fact of the matter is I can show data uh, all day long, live video is exploding. The big question is how is distribution of live video gonna get done? Let's uh, dive into this a little bit more. So uh, I'm basically, we're going to dive into it uh, because the way we want to create active versus passive outcomes. Current solutions for live event streaming is more passive. What is passive? Passive is more of a traditional broadcast delivered in a linear format where you sit back and you observe what is, what is happening. We want to create a more of an active flow. We want to create active flows where we as end users and fans are engaged. Engagement creates consistency. Engagement creates gamification. Engagement creates monetization opportunity. Engagement reduces churn. Engagement includes any number of outcomes that really lead to a more consistent behavior that we can obtain as providers of technology with our tech with our targeted audience, and that can happen in any number of ways. Active engagement can happen with live social, where we are watching things together with dissimilar audiences separated by many distances. And we are, we are saying, uh, look how we are watching this event and seeing things similarly as well as differently. Active enga engagement can happen with live betting and gamification as shown in the middle uh, screen or active engagement can happen with something more advanced. AI ML can be done at the edge in real time to show us a game in a totally different way. But we as technologists, we as industry specialists, we need to figure out how to make this happen. And to really understand this, we're gonna to have to start with what the problem is. <clears throat> so uh, let's take a look at the workflow. This workflow, uh, has been, you have a series of cameras at a live event. <clears throat> We're going to pick American football for lack of a better uh, example. Uh, you have all these cameras. Each one of these cameras is ultimately attached to an encoder. And that encoder is going to create an RTMP workflow. And that we all know RTMP has been around forever and ever and ever. Uh, and then the RTMP is sent from the on-prem encoder up to the cloud. 
what does the cloud do? The cloud starts doing the heavy lifting. The cloud starts doing the video uh, processing necessary for the workflow, including scaling, transcoding to full adaptive bitrate ladder and packaging. It takes that RTMP stream and creates a HLS format and a dash format. So there's a lot of processing going on in the cloud. This processing takes time, takes money, requires many different vendors or services, and it could be a bit of a problem depending on what you're ultimately trying to achieve. Once you create that HLS dash workflow, the iOS or Android workflow, Android workflow, you push it to an origin server and then to a CDN to the delivery to the end users and fans. Ultimately, the stream may reside at a place where you have a player, a social application, a betting application, or any number of applications where it is a second screen or main screen in front of the consumer or fan. So this is the delivery mechanism, source video through the encoder into the cloud, delivered via origin CDN to your second screen or primary device, be it a phone, tablet, PC, or connected TV. All of these pieces together cause a more complex solution. With this complexity, reliability, quality, and flexibility can be uh, affected. And it definitely has an impact on latency. And because we're relying on the cloud, we also have an OPEX cost issue. So let's think about how we can change this from the traditional workflow. What we're talking about here is the idea of a video compute platform, an edge-based video compute platform. What is this platform? Well, let's make it akin to what a smartphone is. A smartphone started up being a cell phone. A cell phone became a smartphone. When computing functions were added to the cell phone, it became smart. And that compute enabled a wide range of applications to be used on with that smartphone. Let's apply this logic, same logic to encoders. Encoders are a single purpose device. Its job is to get video into the cloud, just like a cell phone was to get voice into a carrier network. Now, if we take that video processing, the video encoding, and we put computing power alongside of it, and we create some base functionality, we, now, we will now have, instead of a single function encoder, a multi-purpose video compute platform. Well, that changes a lot of things because when you, if you have a video compute platform, those functions that were otherwise happening in the cloud can start to happen on premise. In the upper right corner, we have a list of functions that would natively happen in the cloud. They, these can be moved judiciously to on-prem in that video compute platform. And one of the most obvious things to start to address the needs that we are talking about today with live event streaming and low latency is, in, is the idea of packaging. Packaging becomes a really important because if we can package properly, we can change the traditional workflow quite a bit. So again, uh, we think that there are ways to change live event streaming to have a better experience where we can achieve quality and reliability with the flexibility with lower cost but it has to start with the delivery of low latency video. Let's uh, dive into some of the use cases. So what's going on in this workflow is a showcase of how video can be delivered in a way that's different. What did we show before? We showed a source video going into an encoder that produced an RTMP stream that went up to the cloud, went through a cloud uh, transcode and ultimately into an origin server, then out through a CDN. Take a look at what's happened here now differently when we introduce edge compute. What is edge compute again? It's a combination of advanced video processing with computing power and key functions. With live video, we need to solve the latency problems. <clears throat> what we can do is we could use the computing power that's on the edge of a platform, edge device, and put packaging on premise. We can package in different ways that we can bypass or augment what's going on in the cloud. So instead of the cloud being relied upon to do all the heavy video processing and transcoding, we can move that processing all the way down to on-premise into, into this edge computing device that allows us to output directly HLS and Dash in a low latency format. And then with that, we can run it straight into an origin shield in front of a CDN and immediately push this through the network to the player in a very, very low latency method. What we've shown here in the diagram is an HTTP-based workflow that supports both the Android and Apple worlds with HLS and Dash. 
we could substitute the output of this edge compute device by saying SRT. And with the SRT, uh, low latency workflow is also supported. You could take the that edge compute environment and uh, take it a step further and include a WebRTC as a server on the edge compute platform and output directly to WebRTC workflows. So in other words, with compute on the edge on a video compute uh, platform, HTTP, SRT or WebRTC workflows can move functions from the cloud to on-premise so that we can reliably deliver low latency video that's best suited for the application. So how does this become a reality? Let's take a look what, what the innards or guts of a video compute platform might look like. So again, what is a video compute platform? It's an advanced video processing combined with computing power for live event applications. We really want to dial back that latency. We want to get the proper packaging that can output exactly what is needed to serve the customer. So as we look at this diagram, there, are, there in the upper left is our advanced video processing, basically the classic encoder functionality, color space conversion, scaling, encoding, transport stream uh, multiplexing. That is the processing that converts the baseband video or IP video and transcodes it or encodes it to the proper AV metadata format. And then in the upper right, we start using the compute power of the platform and we put in the packager where we output the formats that we want to package directly to. It could be HTTP based, uh, HLS or Dash. It could be WebRTC. It could be SRT. It could be a mixture of all three of them. And since this is a computing platform, it could ultimately be Apple low latency HLS. It could include formats like RIST and QUIC. It could move with the industry because it's a programmable platform. And then what you uh, do with this you can make this data available to cloud-based origin servers, and you can push all this information properly into a CDN. So you package it, you post it to the origin server, and the CDN distributes it. Now, that's great. It creates a workflow, but by itself, it's not enough. What we need is an integrated workflow that is part of an overall solution. So how do we make this happen? Well, we have computing, and you need to add workflow control. This is enabled by giving access to the control of the encoder, the packager, and the platform. It might be an XML access from the cloud where you talk to a local API, or it could be a local web server. It could be a cloud client. In other words, you give control of the platform to the workflow in a way that the cloud can manage the device and integrate it into the workflow. So we've touched upon the main functions of the video compute platform, the encoder, the package, or the control. Well, let's take it one more step forward and look in the lower left and now we put the power into developers. What we're talking about here is giving CPU, NPU, GPU, DSP, and a number of other platform functions to a developer where they can use the capability that is enabled such as uh, tip, that's enabled such that a typical online video platform can take advantage of the compute on the edge and create unique outcomes and applications. What would happen if this customer compute area was based on Docker? What would happen if containers built for the cloud could seamlessly deploy on-premise and run this uh, right on the platform? Cloud and edge would then become complementary, not uh, competition. So let's review. We have the encoder, we have packaging for low latency, we have cloud control, and we have compute area that's cloud-friendly because it has Docker containers where cloud-based containers can move on-prem or run them in the cloud. You start to think about what this means. You have the ability to integrate from video source all the way through cloud to CDN to directly to the player. This workflow starts to become very interesting when, and you can do some unique things. Uh, another thing that you could add to this is AIML. You could run custom AIML inferences right on the platform and uh, enrich the, the video content right at the source. So let's build up this, what we're trying to do. So we as an industry uh, for live events are trying to create a main screen and a second screen event experience. For this to be really, uh, really great, it needs to happen as quickly as possible. We need to address the latency uh, problem. If the latency is 30 seconds or more, user engagement will be a challenge. As mentioned earlier, social watching, gamification needs to have low latency. 
If latency is 30 seconds or more, the chance for a user to be engaged in a deep, meaningful way is eroded. If by using the video compute platform, you can reduce the latency to 10 seconds, to three seconds, to even a sub-second latency, users will be more tightly engaged to the live event. For instance, think of a baseball game. Gamification of what the next pitch uh, is going to be requires a sub three second latency, which will drive additional engagement. Additional compute can also be done to provide real-time statistics to drive additional engagement. Providing the users the ability to pick other camera feeds will also provide the ability to users and fans to define their own experience. All of this drives uh, to creating an outcome that has low latency, has many options, such as many vi different video feeds, that increases end user engagement, increases monetization, and reduces churn. Technology has to come together to solve this problem. Edge-based video compute platform in conjunction with cloud services is well, su well suited to solve this problem. This solution must be standards-based as basically every other speaker has said. One-offs will not work. As soon as you do this as a one-off, it will create a splintered experience. By doing it with standards, you can deliver to a broad and dissimilar audience a similar experience. It also solves another problem because with video compute platform, you can now do things with regards to OPEX. You can reduce the reliance on the cloud by moving logical processing from cloud to the edge. You can reduce your uh, development deployment costs as you have less steps to be integrated and secured. So what is the outcome? The outcome to an uh, to, is an audience experience that has improved quality, lower latency, higher level of engagement, unified experience, uh, experience across a wide number of platforms and lower cost. The outcome provides the user or fan a customized, personalized, a customized, personalized experience. We are just starting to touch the surface of what's really possible. The notion of augmentation of the traditional broadcast is happening before our eyes. The idea of fan engagement, of being a continual process is made possible if we can move from the traditional RTMP workflow to a cloud complementary edge-based video compute platform that allows us to deliver video in a low latency enriched way. It's been my pleasure to be here as part of these sessions. I appreciate the effort, the opportunity uh, for me, Paul Brown, the co-founder and CTO of Videon to share you, with you some ideas uh, how we can create great outcomes for users. Hey, great stuff, Thank Paul. Thank you very much. And I'll, uh, I'll encourage everyone uh, to, to go ahead and, and type your questions in the chat. A uh, cu couple of comments, maybe a question from me while we're, while we're waiting for that, Paul. But it is interesting how there were, there were parallels, certainly, between what Grant was saying and what you're saying. You're using edge compute to create, effectively, your encode ladder, uh, all the different bit rates at the edge. And you're in control of that for sports, as you discussed, uh, and second screen you can control the latency at the, 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 at, the, at the source during the encode to keep that, that latency down to a reasonable level. So that, that was a very interesting parallel. And um, I'll keep watching here, but a, a, a question from me in, in, your, in the model that you laid out, uh, the, a DRM and encryption, that would, be, that would be handled by the CDN, is, the, is uh, fair to say? The DRM encryption could be done as well as in the packager. So it you could. can run that okay. in a Docker container, or you could use a cloud-based DRM solution to origin server. Uh, so you do all the encoding, do all the packaging and everything, and then you send it up for DRM uh, with a packager uh, origin server. Gotcha, gotcha. So you reduce, you don't have to trans, you don't have to encode then transcode and then package, we can do one encode and one packaging. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense, yeah. And certainly you spoke about second screen uh, and, the, and the requirements around there, but also, I mean, there's more and more applications for content uh, getting back to the actual venue uh, and, and fans in stadiums. And of course, they're not gonna want a lot of latency when they're, when they're yeah, seeing yes. content on the screen. Right? And yeah. that's where, 5G, 
uh, has, there's a lot of new stuff. They have a couple of consortiums. I think in the UK it's called Vista where they're doing in venue in sports venue, uh, type of video distribution using multicast on uh, 5g where they yeah. can slice, uh, bandwidth for specific, uh, video applications. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. I don't see. So we could have, we could have added a lot of detail on yeah. 5g adding 5g edge computing. Uh, could be a presentation in, by itself. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, I'm keeping uh, an eye on this here, but uh, I don't see any questions in the chat. So I'll, I'll say thank you, Paul. Really, really uh, great stuff. Really appreciate your time and sharing, uh, sharing, sharing this with, with our group. Thank you. Okay. And... Uh, believe I'll be turning it back to Tony at this point. I'll say one last comment, if I may, Tony. Yes, sir. Corny as it may be, I'll, I'll end by, by saying, uh, remember, if you're not living on the edge, you're taking up too much space. Good one. Good one. Hey, you know what? Uh, our goal as, as, as Simpty Chapter is to always be uh, educational and um, tonight's presentations uh, definitely knocked it out of the park. Um, I find it intriguing that uh, we come up with uh, various topics and um, I'm not sure about all of you, but my head is spinning because there's so much information here and, uh, you know, just the, some of the ideas and the technology that's coming down the pike is just uh, amazing. So, uh, Chris, Michael, Grant and Paul, thank you very much for a great, great evening. Uh, my camera still uh, turned off because it uh, Windows decided to not allow me to turn it back on again. So, uh, but I'll stay in the dark here. Um, and and as well, uh, I also want to thank um, you know Jamie and uh, and Roy and Ilya for putting together a great meeting as well. Um, you know, it takes a team to. Put this all together and uh it's great that we can share some of this information so uh i i thank everybody so just a couple of other slides that i'd like to uh bring forth uh I, again tonight's meeting is recorded uh some of the participants um uh, we don't have clearance so we'll be editing some of this out um and now future meetings now our december meeting is going to be a little different we tried to do a face-to-face -face, but uh that we're not ready for yet and some of the facilities that we were looking at uh coming to uh, or trying to uh, entertain a meeting uh they're not ready yet either because they're in their self uh, also trying to figure out how to bring their own staff back so uh that's going to take a while yet before we uh, do some face-to-face -face, uh, meetings, um, but we're doing something different. We are uh, we've um, hooked up with um, uh, concert, um, the art and time essential presence, and it's it's a Christmas uh, thing. So uh, if you're in the Toronto area, and if you're a Simpty member. Um, You'll, you'll have gotten or you will get another email blast inviting you to uh, the presentation um, uh, and uh, all of the rules and regulations follow that as well. So uh, look out for the uh, email blast that will likely come out uh, again on Monday. Uh, on January the 19th, we will have a joint meeting with our uh, Western Canada subsections. Uh, we are looking at uh, uh, remote productions, but more of a spin on remote productions for post-production, for broadcast, and how that uh, plays out, how end users are using, because it, it is always challenging um, uh, for remote productions, and it's always interesting to hear how people are, are, are using it. Uh, February the 15th, uh, I believe that is the date that we're locking in on. Uh, we have our annual student event focused where we bring in some uh, presenters that uh, will specifically uh, 
uh, relate to students. Um, you know, we're looking for uh, various presentations on gaming and and things of that nature. So uh, we're really into assisting the students in in um, helping them in their career paths. Um, I'm not sure if any of you were involved in the ATC 2021, which happened at the beginning of this month. Um, they did have a fellowship awards night uh, during one of those uh, evening events. Um, but coming next week, uh, when, uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, November 30th and December 1st, they will have the rest of the presentations for awards that would normally be at the ATC um, and, and various awards, uh, honorary awards, uh, progress medal rewards, the David Snoroff Award. Uh, there's, there's a slew of them. Uh, I have bolded the citation for outstanding service to the society because there's three people in Canada that won that particular award. And there's uh, our partners in Montreal, Daniel Gavon and Francois Bordua and myself are all recipients of that particular award. So uh, all of us are uh, blown away and we look forward to uh, the evening presentation when this is, uh, is going to air. I believe that particular award is being held on December the 1st. Uh, registration to actually join the presentation is free, so um, um, I didn't give a URL here, but if you point your browser to uh, org, uh, you'll easily find a, a place to uh, drill into this and sign up for a couple of evenings of presentation, uh, sorry, not presentations, but uh, awards presentations. So uh, it should be a fun uh, couple of evenings. Um, again, this is just some information as to how to get a hold of us. Uh, website is simply.org slash Toronto or section slash Toronto. And then if you want to become a friend and join our mailing list, that's the URL and um, the various social channels that we have. We, you can send us an email and we'll always uh, respond to that. So uh, that's it for now. Um, again, till um, our next meeting will be in January. We won't have a meeting in December. Uh, as I mentioned, we'll have a, a, um, a theater event. Um, so um, for those that are outside of the Toronto area, you have the month of December off as far as SIMPTE is concerned, or, or SIMPTE Toronto, but we'll uh, regain and you'll get some uh, email notices on, um, on our January meeting. So I'd like to thank everybody, especially all the presenters tonight again, and the co-organizers as well. Thank you very much and uh, stay safe. We'll talk later. Bye-bye uh, for now.